Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Luke Beckman analyzes corn and soybean markets. Nathan Mueller discusses reducing input costs for next season's crop. Mike McCarville describes the link between soybean aphids and soybean cyst nematodes. And Bruce Broderson updates us on the severity of the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag is our marketing analyst this week. The latest crop progress report shows farmers are winding down in the fields. The nation's growers have harvested 94% of their soybeans and 89% of their corn. Nebraska is one of four states to have finished with soybeans. The others are Louisiana, North Dakota, and South Dakota. We talked with Luke Wednesday afternoon as soybeans were closing out another bad day. They were down Friday, up Monday, and back down Tuesday and Wednesday. We started by asking about the reason for the jumpy movement. That's a good question. You know, the beans definitely got a little bit of a pop here through October, first couple weeks of November. Uh, you know, soybean meal was kind of the last story these, you know, last few weeks. And really, it's just kind of a technical, technical move right now. Fundamentally, things haven't really changed in the beans. So we're seeing some long liquidation on the charts. Uh, we also had some divergence in the stochastics uh, on the charts for beans here this past uh, couple, couple weeks as well. So. Uh, you're really just seeing some technical stuff take over uh, until we kind of get through this slow Thanksgiving time period next week, get into December, and then you're talking flipping the calendar over to 20 th 2015, rather. There's some support somewhere to be had, hopefully? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're, you're looking at, you know, some, some levels back around $10 is okay. a psychological level. Uh, this, this is going to air later this yeah. week. Who knows if we will have <laughs> been through that. But $10, uh, you're looking at uh, some retracement levels there as well as that psychological figure, so hoping that can hold. Where's basis at on soybeans in your area? And that is a wide area of Nebraska. Sure, I mean, you're seeing basis values, uh, probably see a little bit of seasonal strength here. Uh, once we get into December, uh, you know, across the landscape, you know, processors can range anywhere from, you know, the 30 unders to uh, country elevators up into the 80s, somewhere in there. So uh, if you're looking for cash, you know, targets yeah. on the soybeans, uh, probably called Jan Futures at 10 and a quarter, you know, so you're gonna see cash values fall in accordingly. So. Uh, anywhere from maybe a 950 uh, up to uh, the high nines for cash. Where's your longer term view at in soybeans? Well, soybeans, Jeff, it's it's really going to be about you know the the world carryout numbers. You know we're expecting South America today to you know raise a good crop. We obviously raised a good one here, um, so your so your carryout levels are really starting to swell, and so that's going to put a little bit of pressure on 2015 values as well, uh, which makes us a little bit unfriendly uh, in terms of price potential. Describe the export scene for me in soybeans. Uh, excellent. Very hot. Uh, Monday's export inspections, the largest uh, export inspections number that we've had. So uh, it really, we've been moving an awful lot of soybeans, and, and weather has dictated some of that. You talk about the, the guys out east who use the river system. Uh, you know, they've had, for the most part, good weather, trying to move those commodities into the export channels uh, before the rivers freeze up and we get a bunch of uh, issues there. So hot and heavy on the beans. And how does that complement then the crush numbers we've seen in soybeans? Crush numbers have been good. Uh, we had the soybean meal issues, you know, a few weeks back, but we did have NOPA crush numbers on Monday uh, for the month of October, and that was the largest October crush number that we've had in our recent data set. Uh, so crush good, exports good. Overall, we're chewing through a lot of beans. So that was kind of the 
the good feel in beans was the demand story through October, first couple weeks November. Now it's back to reality. We still have a large carryout. Let's move into corn and uh, just first kind of lay out the picture of where ethanol is. Ethanol numbers have been good. You know, we're running a little bit ahead of pace of, of where we would need to uh, to meet the USDA's uh, you know, corn for ethanol number on the balance sheet. This past week uh, was the second highest week we've had for uh, you know, corn for ethanol use uh, going back to you know, our recent history. So the, the largest number was back in June this past summer. So ethanol demand has been very good. Uh, if we continue at this kind of pace, you could expect the USDA to increase corn for ethanol demand by maybe 75 to 100 million bushels before it's all said and done. What are your targets right now for cash corn and for 2015 sales? Now you're talking old crop corn in the bin right now. You're going to look at the December board and probably I anywhere in the, that 385 up to 4 really feels like a level that, that has stopped corn. Uh, so if you look further out on the curve, we're in a market where you're, you're seeing a lot of carry. Uh, getting out into the March, May, July month. So advising producers to look at that. If, if we can get corn into the upper threes, we need to be making sales you know, further out on the curve to protect that carry. And finally, for 2016, is there anything that looks appealing to you at all? Yeah, uh, we, we'd certainly look at it. You know, If you are a typical forward seller and you like to have a certain amount sold pre-planting, uh, this is the opportunity to do that. You, know, you saw December corn climb north of four and a quarter. That's an area we like to put some sales on for soybeans. Uh, anything north of uh, 10 and a quarter would be similar. Next week, University of Missouri Extension economist Ron Plain will join us to analyze hog markets. As we've mentioned in previous marketing interviews and as producers themselves know, break-even costs are much tighter than in recent years. That could mean determining costs of production would be valuable in order to determine the status of profits or losses. Earlier this week, we talked with UNL Extension Cropping Systems educator Nathan Mueller about why it's so important to assess input costs. You really need to know um, how much it costs for your fertilizer, and then are you getting additional money back if you're increasing the rates? The same thing comes down to how much are you spending on seed per acre, how much are you spending on cash rent. So that's really looking at an accrual balance for a crop or a farm, and once you know that, mm -hmm. then it's easier to say, if I do this particular management practice, we might expect X bushels gained, but it costs this much. Yeah. And so it really helps making um, decisions, especially when margins are tight. Yeah, uh, you say that the input cost could be as much as 35% of your operation. Yeah. That's, that's a significant amount. Yeah, so f uh, seed, fertilizer, mm -hmm. and chemical, and you know, as an agronomist, those are the main ones sure. I'm gonna focus on. And so, you know, that makes up, you know, a fairly large percent, yeah. so how can we make improvements within that area. Uh, in September for Market Journal, we talked about soybean seed selection, and uh, that was one of the areas that you really felt was one that could be capitalized by farmers. Yeah, and I think the main reason is you're not actually just going to spend more money or less money in that area. Your goal is to do a better job with the money you're spending. So within those varieties, we know there's differences in performance. So there's differences in, in genetics and how they interact with your management and the area. And so the main focus is to gain that extra yield from variety selection. There can be a 15 bushel difference in performance. So you're, you're spending the same money, but you're getting extra yield. And so there you're not cutting costs, you're just doing a better job of spending the money you have. Now that we're done with the harvest, or at least close to done mm -hmm. with the harvest, where can people go for more information about finding yield results? Yeah, a lot of the area I go, just because of the massive data in the region is first trials. They have multiple locations across Nebraska and across the whole Midwest. So you can see, did maybe this variety or hybrid perform good in eastern Nebraska, but maybe it didn't um, over in Iowa. So that's some questions then to ask your seed agronomist or your production agronomist. Why would that be? Why did it perform here? What were some management or environmental issues? Let's move into fertilizer as an input cost. Critical first to determine what's actually uh, in the soil profile? Yeah, uh, soil tests. If you look at, you might only spend uh, $1 an acre for the soil mm -hmm. test and it makes maybe $100 difference in, in how much you're gonna spend. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is if you haven't had a recent soil test is to take one. And then the, the next question is how do you take it? Well, you can do on a per field basis, which is the cheapest. But you know with your yield monitor, if you can look at that, that this area has been consistently low yielding, this area high. So it's likely you've been removing different amount of phosphorus, different amount of potassium. So looking at that and then putting that fertilizer where you're most likely to see a return. So putting fertilizer on the low testing soils and less or none on the high testing soils. So again, you may, your total amount of fertilizer bill may be the same. You may be putting the same total amount on, but you're distributing it where you're going to get the most return. With chemical, uh, you said it's not always with input costs something where 
uh, you're going to reduce the amount you spend and get more back. It's yep. not always the way it's going to go. And chemicals, one of those things. Yeah, chemical, one of those. You know, can we reduce? Maybe do a half a rate, a pre-emerge. Well, there in this coming year, that may not be the best decision. For example, uh, in areas we had hailed up in Dodge County, Burke County, Cumming County, there was a lot of water hemp that went to seed in those fields, uh, especially in those cornfields that people kept. So we're going to have this huge seed bank to deal with, and so there may be a situation where you. Spending a little bit more money uh, is going to gain you more yield than it normally would. The yield results site Nathan mentioned is firstseedtest.com. We'll link to it on the Market Journal homepage. You can find more information from Nathan on his blog at croptechcafe.org. The November Nebraska farmer says the supply picture for propane is much improved over a year ago. Cinch Munson of the Propane Education and Research Council tells Nebraska Farmer in this month's issue that suppliers and distributors have increased the amount of propane they can store and supplies are in good shape for winter. He also reviews the council's financial incentives for producers who purchase propane fuel irrigation engines or certain models of grain dryers. You can read how to apply for those incentives in the November Nebraska Farmer. We already know that soybean aphids and soybean cyst nematodes can drag down soybean yields. But now, Iowa State researchers have found the presence of aphids in a field can actually increase the likelihood that field will have SCN. Mike McCarville, who now works with Bayer Crop Science, conducted the research with Matt O'Neill and Greg Tilka at ISU as part of his master's and PhD work. We recently talked with Mike about the discovery and why he thought to look into a possible link between the two. Soybean aphids and soybean cyst nematode are both invasive to the U.S. And when you look at them, they both feed from similar parts of the plant, even though one's above ground and one's below ground. They're both feeding from the vascular tissue of the plant, which moves nutrients about the plant. And then researchers that were working on each pest individually saw that both interact with the plant quite a bit and actually can manipulate the plant's defenses. So we kind of thought two pests that might be manipulating the soybean plant's defenses and feeding from similar uh, tissue in the plant could have a large uh, potential to interact. What did your field trial show when you took this out to the actual uh, soybean plant? Yeah, so we originally started out in a field with some really small uh, plots uh, maybe about 10 plants large, and we saw some huge increases of almost five times more nematodes when we added aphids to plants. Um, we've since kind of built that uh, project up, and we've looked at now uh, larger plots, more something that a farmer would be familiar with. And kind of what we've seen is there's a direct relationship between how long the aphid is on the plant and how much we see in increases in nematode populations. We see about a 33% increase in every generation of SCN reproduction that overlaps with soybean aphids. Now this is especially concerning because in the Midwest we can get three to six generations of SCN reproduction. We know that you can take a yield, hit, a yield hit from aphids, we know that you take a yield hit from soybean cyst nematode, but when the two of them come together, what does it do to yield? So we don't have a great handle on that yet. We know individually that aphids can reduce yield by up to 40%, and we know that nematodes can reduce yield by up to 50%. Now with both, the amount of yield hit that you're gonna get is directly proportional to how many of each one of those pests is on the plant. For nematodes, uh, we see kind of a strong relationship with both the number of nematodes at the beginning of the season and how much reproduction we get throughout the season. So anything that's going to increase that, like aphid feeding, increasing nematodes, is going to increase the loss that we see from soybean cyst nematode. You said it mattered how long the aphids uh, were on the soybean plant. Does it then uh, further reinforce the need to control aphids when they reach a certain threshold? Yeah, so right now farmers are recommended to spray soybean aphids at 250 aphids per plant. Uh, there's a large data set that's built around that for the Midwest. And that seems to be a good recommendation. However, that was built in the absence uh, of thinking about this soybean cyst nematode problem. So we don't have a good handle yet on how that might shift that threshold. In the field, we've seen aphid populations as low as 50 per plant actually increase nematode reproduction. So we know that 250 threshold that we have for aphids isn't going to be able to handle this increase that we see uh, in nematode populations. 
but we don't have a good feeling on how we should adjust those recommendations just yet. Your research was done in Iowa, sponsored by the Iowa Soybean Association, but do you think it carries to Nebraska or Illinois or Minnesota or other regions that heavily grow soybeans? Absolutely. Um, obviously, we talked about the overlap and how long aphids are present on the plant being important. So one big key piece of that is going to be, we know as we move into more northern geographies like Minnesota and the Dakotas, soybean aphids tend to show up earlier in the season. So there's a potential for the importance to be even greater there and then kind of diminish as we go south. So I think a big driver is going to be how much overlap there is between soybean aphids and soybean cyst nematodes. When you overlap their distribution map, you're talking about a lot of geographies. What it means in each one, though, is going to depend on probably the ecology of both pests. When aphids show up, how often they're going to be present, um, those types of things. We can also get into you know, soybean cyst nematodes. Really, its ability to damage the plant is dependent on soil type, soil moisture, a lot of those kind of factors that vary geography to geography. So I think this is going to be something that we need to get a better handle on the environmental factors so that we can start to ratchet in any sort of uh, extension recommendations that we give growers. Mike, does it matter what variety, if you plant a variety that's SCN resistant, does it appear? Yeah, so that's a great question. That's one of our biggest concerns going into this was we saw a lot of problems in the field with the most common source of SCN resistance, PI88788. That represents over 95% of the SCN resistant varieties out there, which is what farmers are primarily using to manage SCN. So we see soybean aphids able to cause SCN increases on both the susceptible soybean varieties for nematodes, but also on the PI88788 resistant varieties. So those farmers who are struggling the most with nematodes, this interaction is going to be critical for their fields. As we've told you before, UNL Extension believes SCN cost Nebraska soybean growers $45 million in lost yields during the 2013 season, more than all other diseases combined. Nebraska recorded its first case of the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus in December 2013. PEDV was first confirmed in the United States on May 17, 2013 in Iowa. The positive test peaked in February and then started falling off after April. The USDA's quarterly hogs and pigs report in September showed inventory was down 2% from a year ago, which isn't just an issue for hog producers. A United Soybean Board study shows broiler chickens and hogs are the two biggest consumers of U.S. soybean meal, with pigs using the meal from about 410 million soybean bushels in 2012. As we said when we first started this discussion more than a year ago, the virus carries no threat to other animals, food safety, or humans. This week, as colder temperatures are again here, we talked with UNL's Bruce Broderson to reset biosecurity precautions producers can be taking on their operations and update its severity over summer and fall. Well, it, it seems like it's been fairly stable through the summer and so far this fall. Of course, it's been uh, pretty warm this fall yet up until the last 10 days or so. So we haven't seen a big uptick in the number of cases so far. What have we learned about its transmission? Is it uh, going through feed? Is it airborne? What do we know now that we didn't know at this point last year? Well, there's not, so, not much evidence that it's really airborne, but uh, it, it, there has been some work that's shown that it is in feed samples or feed stuffs. So you uh, have to be careful about the kind of feed stuffs that you're using and, and um, you know, those, those types of things anyway. Has the industry been able to get a handle on death loss or is it about 100% if you manage to get it in your herd? Well, in, in those herds that are totally naive, why well, there's gonna be pretty much 100% death loss in pigs that are less than a week of age. Pigs that are older will survive and, and as they become older and older, when they're infected, uh, their survivability goes up quite a bit, so. There is a vaccine option that's now on the market. Do you know anything about its efficacy or how it's being used? Yeah, there's a couple of different vaccines on the market, and the one that I know some information about, there is some evidence that it is has some efficacy, so, so there is some bright spots in the future as far as control of vaccines. The immunity issue, you know, initially we thought once a herd got it, that was it. It was going to be immune and wouldn't be able to get it again, or at least the sows wouldn't be able to. What about now? Um, there's been herds, reports of herds that rebreak, 
with with diarrhea in those in those baby pigs in the farrowing rooms. So so it's not a hundred percent protection if the sows go through that infection. Um, so repeated controlled exposures or in the future vaccines will help uh, alleviate some of those problems. The uh... American Association of Swine Veterinarians is also keeping an eye on the swine Delta coronavirus now. Explain what that virus is and, and kind of how it's impacting herds. Well, it's, it's uh, as the name says, it's a coronavirus and, and PED virus is also a coronavirus along with TGE virus. And so it's just another form of coronavirus that infects pigs. It doesn't seem to be as virulent as PED virus in terms of uh, the amount of uh, mortality I was concerned. So, you know, it might not be 100% mortality in those very young pigs that, that get exposed. You're doing some work with some other universities around the Delta coronavirus. Tell me about that. Yes, we, uh, we were able to get a grant through the Nas National Pork Board in conjunction with Kansas State and South Dakota State Universities. And so we've done an experimental infection and been pretty successful in reproducing disease, the disease and, and um, we did this project to be to have a, an infection model so it can be started further and also to collect reagents for other researchers to use those reagents or those samples to do other things like uh, develop serologic tests those kinds of things you touched on this in the beginning but it's colder in nebraska now why are we more worried about pedv spreading well that virus uh, the coronaviruses in general don't survive very well in the warm dry uh, conditions, but as soon as it gets cold, uh, those viruses will survive a lot longer, and so it can be tracked around and spread a lot easier when it's in cold weather. So, give me some reminders on biosecurity precautions producers can be taking. Yeah, just have to be careful about where you go and what clothes you wear when you go there, and be sure and change clothes and change boots uh, when you come back home, or and, and also going to deliver hogs to market. Why? That's another source of, of uh, contamination, so you can bring it home from there. Anything specific on disinfectants? Uh, just the disinfectants that uh, uh, are typical, like uh, one-stroke Environ is a common one that's effective against uh, uh, coronaviruses, and, and of course bleach works very well too. Bruce says UNL is also beginning a study that tracks how long PEDV can survive in compost. We'll update you on the outcome of that project. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here again for the weekly forecast. During this past week, of course, we've seen the cold air slowly ease its way out of the region. Uh, western Nebraska definitely got much warmer than eastern Nebraska, but we did start to see the temperatures break above the freezing mark during the midweek period and then floating around there in eastern Nebraska for the last couple days. Now today, with the warm front that went through yesterday, we're going to see a very nice day. It's going to feel exceptionally warm compared to what we've been accustomed to, especially in the eastern part of the state as we approach the highs in the 50s. But more importantly, uh, it does look like we got one more system to deal with as we get late this week and early next week, and then the models diverge in regards to how cold or how warm it is. So my forecast is going to be based off of the GFS model. The European model is significantly colder and isn't so optimistic for Thanksgiving. So let's take a look at the upper air forecast and see what we can expect in terms of temperature and precipitation in this next week. Two things in, to keep in store here. We have a trough that's moving through Texas, that's in the southern stream, and then we have another northern stream trough that is starting to move toward the east-southeast. And as these bypass Nebraska, they're expected to merge and explode this system over the northern plains up in the upper portions of Minnesota and create a fairly significant snowmaker. Some of this may actually impact northeast Nebraska, where right now most of the moisture is kept out of the region. So as this system passes to our east, we're going to get these downsloping winds and we're going to get some nice temperatures today. Everybody should be up close to the 50 degree mark. In western Nebraska, we may actually see some temperatures approaching the upper 50s. Now by the time we get to tomorrow, you can see that this cold air really starts to fill in um, as this two systems merge in a single trough. So the cold front is expected to come through the northwest part of the state as we get into the early morning hours, daylight hours, and then gra rapidly press toward the southeast. There's not a lot of moisture with this. Most of the moisture is going to be cut off from the south 
and the moisture will be co concentrated around this upper air low, and in between there's not much to work with. So I'm not expecting significant moisture. The only area of concern would be extreme northeastern Nebraska. If this system gets really wound up and spreads out, we could get some backside snow activity that might result in a couple inches. But more importantly, as we get into Monday, this upper air low tracks toward the Great Lakes, and we get this northwest flow aloft. It's going to be short-lived according to GFS, but it's going to give us a couple days of well below normal temperatures. And as we get into my, uh, Tuesday, we'll start to see this whole system starting to regress eastward, and this big ridge starts to make its way eastward. Now, the European model holds back this ridge for several days compared to the GFS. So for Thanksgiving, we're basically under a cold regime in the European model, but for the uh, GFS, we're looking at much warmer conditions. So by the time we get to Wednesday, you can see this ridge building in. We'll see temperatures starting to go back toward normal. And as we get into Thursday, which is Thanksgiving Day, it looks like a fairly nice day according to the GFS and temperatures that are going to be above normal. And that trend will continue into Friday as we get a broad-based trough or a ridge building over the center part of the country. And we have a trough approaching the western United States that may impact our weather as we get into the very first part of December. So let's take a look at the temperature forecast. We're looking at nicest conditions will be this weekend and then we see that cold air infiltrating into the region. If the models are correct, this will be an accurate forecast. If the European model verifies, then we would expect that the temperatures will be much colder during the midweek period before we do warm up toward the end of the week. 8 to 14 day forecast indicates colder than normal conditions. I think this is overdone and in terms of precipitation, a dry trend. But with that storm coming to the southwest, this also may be, be a blown forecast. More updates next week on the, in terms of the 30 and the 90 day forecast. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, reducing input costs, the link between soybean aphids and SCN, and an update on PEDV. As always, you can follow Market Journal during the week on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next week, Ron Plain will be our hog market analyst. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Whether it's spring planting, fall harvesting, or just a drive across the state, Soy Biodiesel helps a diesel powered engine operate in a demanding job. Soybean oil from Nebraska soybeans makes biodiesel a renewable fuel that's also environmentally responsible. The soybean checkoff plays a major role in supporting the use and availability of biodiesel. The Nebraska Soybean Board, growing opportunity from the ground up.